Uh, tonight, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the north side, as uh, Blanche said. We've talked about um, other parts of town, and so now we're going to do the north side. And originally, this was going to be all the buildings uh, north of the uh, train track, but uh, there are going to be a couple ex exceptions. And the first building we look at is uh, one of those exceptions. Um, I might say that um, as we go through these buildings, I'm going to give uh, the owners, if we know who they are, and also I'm going to tell you um, what we found to be their um, uh, birth uh, uh, year and place and the death year and place. So you get an idea then where all of our uh, pioneers uh, came from. So let's get going. And the first place, I'm sure you recognize this, on the uh, southwest corner of Railroad and uh, South Livermore, <coughs> excuse me, is the old um, Schrader and Montgomery um, blacksmith shop. And best we can tell, this was built in 1914. The, uh, uh oh, we hear some feedback here. Yeah. And that was a little bit of a That's not bad. I think it traces down here. Oh, I hear it traces down here. Or this Hello. is. Hello. But no, but you don't pay them. Oh, so. well, Let's see. I don't know if I can talk over them or not. Um, the blacksmith shop was run by Frederick August um, Schrader. And uh, he was born in 1851 in Germany, <clears throat> died in 1915 in Livermore. And. Um, his partner then was Charles Murdoch Montgomery, uh, born in 1868 in Canada. He died in 1944 in San Francisco. And Schrader, uh, like a lot of the people we're going to talk about tonight, owned a saloon. Uh, his saloon was out in uh, the little settlement of Greenville, uh, which was underneath where the uh, freeway is now. Montgomery uh, was a blacksmith here. And then in the 1930s, he uh, moved, he was in San Francisco and, and moved there and was a blacksmith over there. So this is what their uh, building, uh, Fred Schrader's building looked like before he built the, uh, the brick building. We don't have a um, exact date for this, um, but um, somewhere around 1900. And you can see, look at the right in the dead center, you can see a, a tree that's made out of horseshoes. I don't know how they stuck them all on there, but uh, kind of kind of a fun thing. Okay, now across the street then from that is uh, what we call the brick block. And this uh, um, was started then by Andrew uh, Eston in uh, 1870. Andrew, or Alexander rather, um, was born about 1836 in Vermont, and he died 1881 uh, in Livermore, uh, we're pretty sure. Anyway, um, he started again in 1870, a brickyard, which was just north of, uh, of the intersection here. And he was uh, a, quite an operator. He owned uh, 700 acres, but he farmed nearly 2,800 acres um, on the north side of uh, Livermore. And um, after he died, was buried at the, uh, the old Oak Knolls uh, Cemetery at Wall and uh, Stanley. A number of large brick buildings were uh, built on this block, and that's why it was called the Brick Block. But only two survived. And one of them, um, you can see, let's see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this building right here, you'll recognize. And we'll talk about that in, uh, in just a minute. Okay, here is the, uh, the brick building then that's again on the north west corner of Ray Road and uh, North Livermore Avenue. And this was first called uh, Essence Brick Hall, uh, but shortly thereafter it was named uh, the Farmers Union Building. And it was built in 1875, and parts of it, and I, I think the uh, the northern part, the lower uh, one-story, one-and-a-half-story part, 
was torn down in 1929. And finally, the whole building was torn down in uh, 1939. And this uh, was the largest then uh, building, uh, brick building um, made in Livermore. And it was the first brick building uh, in town. And downstairs then they sold uh, farm equipment. Upstairs was the palace hall. And in the palace hall, there was seating for 650 people. So it was quite a quite a big deal. Lots and lots of social events then uh, happened in uh, the Farmers Union building. But because of uh, poor maintenance and whatever, and some new buildings that came to town, um, uh, eventually uh, it fell in disrepair and, and uh, the upstairs wasn't used for a long, long time. And then finally uh, the downstairs wasn't and it sat, uh, sat empty for, for years. Okay, now, Looking down the street, can you see at the, uh, towards the bottom left of your screen, that's the uh, farmer's building then, the farmer's union building. And uh, right over here then was where uh, the blacksmith shops were and what's now the blacksmith square. Right here is the corner of uh, Livermore Avenue and First Street. And this was the old uh, McLeod building, and it was built in 1883. And it was replaced by the Bank of Italy building in 1921. And I'm sure most of you know that uh, that is now the home of the uh, independent uh, newspaper. Okay, let's go back to Railroad Avenue. <clears throat> and this building then, uh, the historic name, and that's what I'm going to do for most of the buildings. Um, in different literature, uh, they're called by uh, the, the early uh, names, either of the owners or, or their use. And so this is the George True building. He is a fellow from um, Germany, born 1846, and he died in 1896 in Livermore. He was the first owner of this building. And this building is said to be the oldest remaining brick building in Livermore. The building has been uh, many things in its long history. It started out as an ag uh, implement shop. It was uh, carriage storage, grain storage, uh, carriage painting shop, machine shop, auto repair, and uh, now of course it's a, uh, a restaurant. Okay, this is the other really old brick building. Uh, also built 1876, uh, but covered by um, uh, stucco. And it was built for uh, John and um, CF, uh, which better known as Christian or Chris uh, Gottemeyer, uh, who was born in 1837 in Germany and died in um, 1885 here in Livermore. And this, this building has had quite a history. Uh, it started out uh, being a saloon and uh, it's been an apartment and the tattoo parlor some of you'll remember that and now it's the city's um, housing services center what would be really nice is if the um, the the old facade uh, could be uh, put back it was a pretty handsome building in its uh, day but uh, all the decorations um, I guess when they stuccoed it you know, in the 1930s, stuccoing was a big, big thing. And um, in the, again, in the 30s, but also some in the 20s. And um, so anyway, all, all the old um, uh, fanciness, if you will, was, uh, was torn off. At one time, it said that uh, Chris and his brother uh, Heinrich, also called Henry, controlled all of the soda and cider business in the valley. So they were important um, uh, people here. Okay, now this is a house that I have to wonder how many of you have ever seen. And this one's on Oak Street. And it's a little hard to get there. You have to be a little careful about how you get there. It's a one-way street. It said this house is um, uh, built in uh, 1900. But I'm thinking that, that uh, it could well be somewhat older than that. 
It was uh, first owned by a fellow named uh, Anton Holman, uh, who was born about 1862 in the Azores. And he died in 1916 in Solano County. Now he was a whaler. And as most of you probably know, that is a very, very dangerous uh, business. And uh, he lost a leg. And uh, I'm not sure how or why, but he ended up in uh, Livermore as a shoemaker. In fact, he, uh, he had his own um, uh, shop here in town. Uh, some people think that this was the first train depot in Livermore, but um, our Livermore railroad expert, uh, Al Frank, uh, does not think that's possible at all. But uh, what he does say is that the size of the building is correct, but this building and the railroad uh, a depot building, but again, about the same size, um, were shown on old insurance maps about the same time. But you, and then look at this house. You can see this, like many of the houses we're going to see tonight, it was added onto. Very, very small to start with, and then uh, little additions. And some of them had lots of additions over the years. Um, this one doesn't, but um, but certainly was added onto. Okay, right around the corner then on um, North K Street is the uh, David Evans Thomas House. And uh, he was born in Wales in 1833, died here in Livermore, 1896. And um, he came here as a miner, but uh, he also was a farmer. And like many others we're going to talk about tonight, he uh, owned a saloon. The next owner of the property was Juan Francisco Argabir, who was born 1820 in Spain and died 1901 uh, here in Livermore, and he was a farmer. What's kind of interesting, um, he had a son and daughter that uh, never married, and they stayed in this house uh, and until at, at least the 1940s, and so, uh, so quite a long, long time uh, in this house. Okay, right down the street is a house that's uh, been really well taken care of. Again, on North K Street, this house was built about 1888 uh, by Almond uh, uh, Weymouth. He was born 1839 in Maine and died in 1901 here in Livermore. He was a farmer, um, a, a vineyardist, a carpenter, he owned a lumber yard and a planing mill. The uh, next owner was Frederick uh, Christopher Lassen, who was born 1879 in Germany and died 1954 here in Livermore. Now, he owned Lassen's uh, brother uh, coal and feed company, and that was on L Street where the uh, Growth Brothers used car lot was. Um, and let's see, Lassen um, also served on the town council and uh, for a while uh, actually was the mayor of uh, Livermore. Now this is a kind of an interesting house and uh, we're doing some research on it right now. This is uh, at the um, corner of K and uh, Park Street. This house is said to have been built in 1870 but uh, Loretta Kasky's uh, been researching this and uh, turns out uh, if it was built in 1870, it wasn't here because looking at all the old insurance maps, um, this whole lot was uh, vacant. And so if the house was built in 1870, which it well could have been by the style of it, that uh, it wasn't here, it was moved here. And um, it turns out in the old days, lots and lots of houses uh, were moved. It wasn't, uh, wasn't a big deal. Okay, the property we know was owned at one time by Ramon Bernal, and then uh, later, um, sometime before 1920, Emmanuel Martin's uh, Tom um, bought it. He was born in 1867 in the Azores, died 1947 uh, here in Alameda County. Now, he was a railroad uh, laborer. Um, and again, this is kind of puzzling where this house was. It, again, it could not have been built here. Now, again, look at this house. 
uh, the porch was added on um, in more recent years, but look behind the house, you can see there's a, an addition that uh, apparently has been there for, uh, for some time. Okay, this next house, I'm sure uh, all of you recognize on the corner of um, L Street and uh, what is that chestnut, I think it is. And this was built then or for uh, Simon uh, Lurch. And he was born in Austria in 1883, died in uh, Alameda County, 1946. Now he was a junk dealer and he must have done pretty well because this is quite a substantial house. Later, uh, Fred Wagner Jr. owned the house. Uh, the Cerruti family lived in the house. But uh, many of you would know that uh, Chester and Henrietta uh, Fankhauser lived here uh, for many, many uh, years. This house you can see was built in uh, 1917. Right next door is what a lot of people call the Blue Door Antiques. But I hate to tell you the historic name of this place is the Livermore Junkyard uh, because that's exactly how it started life. It, it uh, was a storage building for uh, junk that was uh, collected by the, the owner who lived next door. Now, during World War II, it was converted into four apartments. Then after the war, it opened up again as a warehouse. And then the Fankhausers uh, opened their antique business here in uh, 1973. Now this is a house, I, I, I like this house. This is a, a pretty nice little house um, built in uh, about 1879. We don't know exactly, but it was pretty close to that, uh, plus or minus a year or two. And it, it was built then for um, Chris uh, Gardemeyer, who we've already talked about. And then the next owner was Charles Breedhoff, who was uh, born in 1861 in San Francisco, died in 1901 in Oakland. And then the next owner was Frederick Lawrence uh, Sangmester, who was born in 1864 in uh, California, died in 1926 in Livermore. Now, Gardenmire, we already talked about, was a Livermore pioneer and a saloon owner. Now, Breedhoff, as best I can tell, uh, never lived here. He was a bookkeeper and accountant in uh, Oakland. And then Sangmaster um, uh, certainly lived in Livermore. He lived in this house. We know that. And he owned uh, saloons um, here in Livermore, including the, uh, the hub uh, with Norn, uh, no, uh, excuse me, Norm uh, McLeod. He bought the house in um, 1897. Now here's an ad we found in one of the old newspapers uh, when Chris Gardemeyer um, owned the house uh, and he's advertising then his sample saloon, uh, one of a couple that he owned, uh, where only superior brands of wines, liquors, and cigars um, are sold. Now his mother um, had an interesting business she was Margarita uh, Dorothea Diedrichsen uh, Gardemeyer. She was born in 1822 in Germany, died 1901 in San Francisco. And she was the mother then of Chris and Henry. Uh, she had shops in uh, Livermore and San Francisco um, making uh, what we'd call wigs today. Um, they, they just call it human and the imitation hair work. Now this is a really neat house and I, I, I see there a lot of work going on as I drive by it uh, recently. Uh, they just repainted the whole house. I, I don't know anything about this house and uh, it's on my list of, uh, of places to research. It looks like the people are doing a really fine job of uh, restoring it. So when you drive by uh, 415 North Livermore, take a look. I think this is, um, going to be quite a, a show place when they're, they're finished. Now, one of the places we get asked about, and I don't have an answer, I've asked the city, and so far um, I haven't got um, an answer from anybody um, in the city, uh, what's happening with this house, if they know. This house 
uh, was built uh, for Henry William Prail, uh, who was born in 1869 here in California, died in 1911 here in Livermore. And he owned the property in 1892. Now the house, uh, the records show it was built about 1900. Now Prail was a butcher and poultry farmer. His wife Agnes was a Christensen and um, his mother was a uh, Coldewith. Now both of these are very, very old time Livermore families with lots and lots of descendants even now. The Prails uh, owned farms out by uh, May School, where the old May School was, as did the Coldaway uh, family. There are several different brothers um, own property um, out there. So this is a, a view standing right at uh, the intersection of North Livermore and Walnut. And this next picture then shows uh, standing on Livermore and then looking directly at the house. I think if this was fixed up, this could be a really, really nice place, but um, it's uh, going through some rough times now. That's, that's for sure. So I, anybody knows what's happening to it, um, uh, please let me know. Now, right across the street is the uh, Fontaine House, which was built 1897 uh, for Pierre Fontaine. He was born 1836 in France died in 1905 in uh, California. And uh, he was in the cooperage business. That is to say, he made wine barrels and he made lots and lots of wine barrels on the lower floor. So he was a cooper, a uh, wine merchant, a vineyardist, and a uh, liquor dealer. And because that house uh, very closely resembles how it was built originally, and uh, the shape that it's in now, the uh, city then awarded this house a, um, a plaque. And you'll see that on a few houses that uh, we look at uh, tonight. Okay, the next house is another one I don't know anything about. And if anybody does, if they'd let me know, I'd appreciate it. This is at 609 North Livermore. It looks to be, at least from the outside, in really good shape. And I'd certainly like to know the history of who built it and who first lived there. Best we can tell, it was built about uh, 1915. Okay, now we're gonna jump over to Olivina and we're going to the uh, Hageman Ranch. Now there's a plaque that says this house was built in 1836. And I think the agreement by almost everybody now is that that would be absolutely impossible. The agreement seems to be by almost everybody, the house was probably built around 1870. And we know it was uh, added onto until uh, at least 1949. And you can see um, there's kind of wings. The, the original house was very small. And then you can see there's wings kind of built to the side of it, but you can see on the, the back left and the back right, um, the additions to the house. So it had been added on to many, many times. Okay, this uh, property was very, very large at one time. And it was part of the old uh, Rancho uh, El Valle de San Jose. And um, in the 1869 uh, breakup of the, of the property. Um, let's see, the owners of the ranch uh, started out being Antonio um, uh, Pico, and then Juan Pablo Burnell, then Martin Mendenhall, who raised uh, horses and uh, stock here, and was a rancher and farmer, and then uh, August and uh, uh, Herbert uh, Hageman. And you can see this was uh, awarded a plaque too, but uh, that's gonna have to be corrected because I think Everybody I've talked to agrees that there's no way this house could have been built in uh, 1836. Let's see, the last owner, um, um, uh, the last Hageman owner, direct owner, was uh, Herbert uh, Hageman Jr., who was born 1921 and died uh, uh, 2000 uh, here in Livermore. Okay, now this house on North O Street is kind of interesting. Gary Drummond, who uh, you may know was the first Livermore historian, 
he reported in a paper that I read that this was the old Mocho school that was out on Mines Road. Um, what would that be? Probably about two and a half miles off of Tesla. And um, the, the papers say this house was built in 1910. Well, the Mocho school was built way before that, way, way before that. And the school was moved, or excuse me, the school was closed in June of 1926 uh, because of lack of students. So I'm not sure uh, if this truly is the old Mucho school when it was moved here. So if anybody has details on uh, that, uh, we'd certainly um, appreciate learning more about it. But uh, anyway, it looks to be in very, very uh, good shape. And here's where it was out on um, uh, Mines Road. You see, um, there's kind of a wall. Let's see if I can point it out to you. Right along here is a wall. Just on the other side of that wall is the Arroyo Mocho. And, um, and that floods every now and then. Uh, we live on a mines road and it's, uh, it doesn't happen very often, but it has flooded. And I imagine that whole area, the lower area must have been flooded. And there's a horse trough, a horse trough down there. And I don't know where the outhouses were. They might have been down there too. Okay, let's move along. We're going to go over to uh, Park Street. And this uh, house um, is listed as a fine example of a working man's house, uh, typical for the period of 1860 to 1920. As far as we can tell, the first owner was Frederick William uh, Renzel, who was born 1855 in San Francisco, died 1924 in Livermore, and he owned the house, uh, we know for sure, 1892. Now, Brenzel is uh, well known to a lot of people in, in the area um, because he drilled many, many of the wells in the uh, early 1900s. Now, look at that house, too. You can see that it has been added on to several times. You can see where the joints are on the, uh, the right side. So it looks like a little section was added, then another section, and then back a little bit was, uh, was another section. So kind of interesting how these little houses were added onto uh, so many times. Okay, now this house, the Ferraria house, uh, built in, uh, we know for sure, in 1911. And this was built then by uh, uh, two brothers, two uh, Albertson brothers. But the one that lived here, uh, at least for some time, was Lewis, or sometimes uh, called Loritz. He was born in 1866 in Denmark, died 1943 in uh, Napa County. And he was a blacksmith. The next owner was Steve, and some kind of, sometimes called Stefano Ferrario. He was born in 1877 in Italy, died 1970 in uh, Livermore. And you probably know Ferrarios, lots of Ferrarios uh, have uh, lived here and still live uh, here in the Valley. So Ferrari owned a soft drink business, um, uh, owned a saloon and a restaurant, and uh, also was a, uh, a merchant. And this house then, uh, like some of the others we've talked about, has earned a, uh, a plaque then uh, from the city. Okay, this one, uh, you know where this is. The, uh, the legal address is 2016 Pine Street. But I think most of us think of it being at Portola and L Street. And uh, Frank Henry Duarte uh, was born 1884 down in Niles and died in 1949 here in Alameda County, uh, was a machinist and the garage proprietor. And he also sold, and it still says so, uh, Durant and Star cars. And I know the Durant and I think the Star also eventually were absorbed by uh, uh, General Motors, and uh, uh, eventually we're done away with since GM owns so many different cars. Here's a picture of it. I don't know exactly when it was taken, but I, I'm guessing around 1920. Now, look right in front um, from the bottom right corner going diagonally to the left. 
That is the old Lincoln Highway, uh, the first uh, transcontinental highway in the United States going from uh, New York all the way to Oakland. And then you could take a ferry then to San Francisco to Lincoln Park. So the first highway across the United States. And you may know that uh, Dwight Eisenhower then uh, was in charge. He was a major then. Uh, he was in charge of, uh, of building the, this uh, first transcontinental highway. Now, look at the, uh, the way the building is uh, decorated and painted. And as it's been restored, it looks almost exactly like that. And uh, look how close the uh, highway is to the building and how narrow the highway is. And then uh, we should point out the main entrance from the west was down L Street. That was the, the way to get into Livermore was down L Street. And I saw, and I can't find a copy of it again, but I saw a picture. Um, those, uh, see the arches there? And on the other side of the street was the same thing, uh, a big um, a buttress. There was a, uh, a sign that went over the top of the street, much like the, uh, the Pleasanton, the downtown Pleasanton sign. Uh, of course, this one said Livermore. And people have asked what has happened to that. And uh, I've never been able to find out. I think it'd be, be fun and neat to um, put it back or something like it uh, back again. Okay, here's a plaque that was donated by the DAR uh, to the library. Okay, now let's go across the street. And across the street um, is uh, kind of what's left of uh, Joesville and the Rock House. And the original building was built in 1914. And Joesville was really quite an operation. Um, it housed a grocery store, a bakery, a restaurant, and cabins. And when I came to town, there still was a hotel across the street, uh, across from the uh, Duarte garage. And Joe uh, Karate uh, was a driving force and a master mason. Um, and uh, as you can see, he collected rocks from all over the place. And um, that theme then has been kept as the new uh, grocery uh, store complex uh, was built. Okay, here's what it uh, looked like, the old rock house. And um, here's Joe and his children. So uh, Richard on the uh, our left, and then Joe himself. And then Anita, who married uh, Richard uh, Gandolfo, and then uh, Albert. Now Joe, uh, whose given name was, and I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, I'm afraid, is Alcolino uh, Paul uh, Karate was born 1887 in Switzerland, died uh, 1980 uh, here in Alameda County. Now this building then I understand was, uh, was moved back as they widened uh, Portola. And then I think, I'm not sure any of this is left or not. Um, I think that building was torn down and the new one uh, was built, but um, We'll have to find out about that. But let's see where uh, Joe and his brother uh, started. And that was downtown Livermore. And uh, I know all of you have been by this building many, many, many times. I don't know if you recognize it um, from this picture or not, but uh, Joe and his brother then, uh, John, Joe's in the truck and John's uh, standing behind the truck. Uh, they had a bakery then, and uh, as it says, uh, also sold ice cream. So do you know where that is? Well, here it is. It's uh, Tips and Toes, uh, downtown Livermore. So the building was built 1878. So another really old building, built in 1878 for the princely sum of $500. Now let's go back out to Portola and um, out towards the freeway is Jerry's Auto Service. And this building, uh, this whole complex was built around 1930. And this is said to be one of the few remaining examples of a highway service station. And some of you may not know that old Highway 50 went right in front of, uh, of this service station on what's now Portola. And the, the station then, this station 
was restored then by uh, Jerry um, Eldon Briarly. And you remember um, his father, Jerry Briarly, owned, uh, I think, several gas stations. Remember, one was at the corner of um, L and uh, First Street, where there still is a gas station. So this was uh, restored by his son, um, uh, who, who was called Jerry. The old elder was called Gerald. It was his given name. So uh, Jerry was born in 1830, excuse me, 1938, died in um, uh, 2008 uh, here in Livermore. And now here's a, a mystery house that, that I don't know the answer to. If anybody does, um, um, please let me know. This is another one we got to do some more uh, research. Um, I think the Morello family owned it for quite a while. It said the house was built in... Uh, 1893, but I don't know by who, and um, I don't know how much property they had. Uh, looking at the size of the house, I imagine they, they must have been uh, pretty well off and owned a, a lot of property in the, in the old days. Okay, now let's go out uh, First Street to uh, Trevano Road, uh, which has been named a historic district by the city. And um, the plan right now is that their Trevano expert and a person who lives there, Susan Canfield, will give a talk of the area this fall. If so, don't miss it. There's a lot of interesting history uh, in this area, and we're not going to go over any of that tonight. But I did want to point out uh, this is a historic district, and it was started in 1913. This whole district then has uh, earned a plaque then uh, uh, from the city and uh, was the home then, uh, the, this, that street was the home then to um, the management then of Coast Manufacturing, which was later um, bought out by uh, Hexel and uh, I had a plant here in Livermore for some time. And here's what it looked like. I think this is around uh, 1920, 1925, something like that. Now, here's another mysterious place that, like the house on Portola, is kind of hard to see. Um, you have to kind of slow down, which is hard to do on First Street. But this is the old uh, Shinoni house, built in 1927. Now, it's kind of interesting, at least to me, that in 1915, Catherine Livermore, who is the daughter of uh, Teresa and Robert Livermore, Jr., inherited 88 acres of the old Livermore Ranch. Uh, she had married Louis Shinoni, and they had two sons, Louis Jr. and Robert. In 1927, Robert and his wife, Anne, uh, built this large home. And the property now is being developed uh, by adding 44 units of affordable housing for adults with uh, developmental uh, disabilities. So it's going to be uh, quite a large complex uh, when it's done. And they're going to save the, uh, the house. From what I understand, uh, the interior is really, really nice. Uh, very, very upscale. Okay, the last place I want to talk to uh, you about tonight is, uh, and again, I'm going to um, murder this uh, pronunciation. I, I call it the Glocken. Um, I'm not sure that's anywhere close to the right pronunciation, but um, Ann Holman and I went out there a few years ago, and as I remember it, the, uh, the house was there. Um, Juan and I went out the other day. Uh, the old house is gone, uh, but I still want to tell you about this uh, house it's, or, or this property. It's, to me, very, very interesting. Um, the fellow that, that owned it, um, when it became... Uh, uh, a prominent place in, in uh, uh, local history anyway, was Herman Bernard uh, Glocken, who was born 1848 in Germany, died in 1932 up in uh, Sebastopol. And Sebastopol is kind of interesting uh, because we're going to talk about um, somebody that had an orchard up there. And I don't know if that's why Herman moved up there or not. Um, Kind of a mystery. My mother was born and raised in Sebastopol, and she remembers um, uh, who we're going to talk about in just a, a few minutes. Okay, uh, Glocken was a, a big operator 
Um, he owned a big warehouse here in the Livermore area, and he also owned a big, big warehouse in uh, San Francisco. But unfortunately, in 19, uh, in March of 1927, um, the Livermore house, the warehouse burned down with 500 tons of hay inside. And so he lost all of uh, all of that. It was a sad day for the family. But what's kind of interesting to me is, um, let's see, I'm having some trouble here. There, I'm sorry. Okay, what's interesting to me is that Luther Burbank, and I think most of you know about Luther Burbank, who invented um, uh, over 800 different varieties of um, uh, mainly fruit. But uh, one of the last things he worked on was uh, over 60 varieties of spineless uh, cacti. And the idea was that he would feed uh, the cacti raw to cattle. And Burbank rented land, not only in uh, uh, Sebastopol and um, um, Santa Rosa area, but also uh, here in uh, the Livermore Valley. And he worked with local ranchers, including uh, Glokin. Now, uh, hit, Burbank's idea was he was gonna plant all the world's deserts with cacti. Um, the trouble was, it wasn't always spineless. And people put a lot of money into the cactus folly, as it was called. And uh, some uh, San Jose paper reported in April of 1913 that in uh, 10 to 20 years, th this just shows the hype that was going on. In 1913, a paper reported that in 10 to 20 years, Many well-informed men believe spineless cactus will supplement and displace alfalfa throughout a great area of the civilized world. And because it grows with little or no irrigation and it grows in any soil. Well, it uh, turns out again, it didn't work. Um, the, the cactus, uh, even though it was mainly, he, he got it, Burbank got it to the point where it was mainly spineless, but apparently they all had spines. And if the spines got in the cattle's mouth, uh, it uh, could get infected and caused all kinds of problems. So um, what was a great idea uh, just, uh, just didn't work out. Oh, here's something I wanted to, to tell you about. Um, in the, the October uh, 1915, um, uh, issue of the Sacramento Union uh, newspaper is stated that C.H. Wente of Livermore has become a firm believer in the use of spineless cactus as a hog feed. And um, I didn't know that uh, I knew Wente's grew, uh, did grow and still grow uh, uh, cattle, but I didn't know um, they were big hog farmers in, years ago. Now the photograph here uh, is said to have been of uh, Glocken's place, but I don't know who those people are. And uh, why I wanna show you is the cactus. And when I look at the cactus, I don't see any uh, spine sticking out. But when Ann Holman and I uh, went up there, uh, as I remember it, and again, this is a few years ago, I remember right next to the road, uh, there was some cactus. But when one and I went up a week ago, um, we didn't see any cactus at all. So I don't know if the people deliberately tore it out or if, um, or it just died of, uh, of old age. Oops, it's not going to the next picture for some reason. There we are. Okay, and this is the, uh, the end of, a brief, uh, my presentation. This is a picture I took of Ann um, uh, when we were looking for spineless uh, cactus. I don't think she saw one there. I don't know what she's taking a, a, a picture of. Okay, um, I'm quite willing to take uh, questions and, and um, hear your comments in just a minute. But first, um, I uh, would like to know, or I'd like to ask you, 
if uh, you know of some interesting houses uh, that we should uh, be researching. If so, uh, please contact me. Also, please support the Livermore Library. Um, they're open uh, part-time now. And um, through all these troubles, um, uh, you've been able to get books um, uh, on order. And then also think about joining the Livermore uh, Heritage Guild. Uh, go to uh, lhg.org and uh, you can see um, what we do and uh, what we're interested in all that. Now, this, uh, this is a plea to, uh, to all of you that are listening. Next month, I'm going to be giving a talk for LARPD about the Old Valley uh, schools. And so if you have photos and stories or know of people who do, um, please contact me. And um, there's my email address, rwfinn at uh, yahoo.com. Yeah, any uh, pictures you have of the schools, and I'm thinking all the way to uh, Midway, up on the hills, um, the Wilson School, um, um, Mocho School. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. We don't probably want to go to Tassajara, but uh, Highland School, Altamont School, and so on. Anyway, any schools that were kind of in the Livermore uh, Valley, um, please um, let me know your stories and uh, let me uh, get copies of photos if you have them. Okay, any questions and comments? Hi, Richard. We've got two questions. The first one is, any information on the two houses behind Target on Las Positas? A rundown house and a tan house across the street. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what's uh, happening there. Um, I'm not sure that's... I'm not sure that's in the city limits. I don't know if it's going to go to the uh, Heritage Preservation Commission or not. It may be a county uh, deal. Um, who owns them? Um, I don't know. And what the immediate plans are, I don't know. You know, uh, some time ago, um, between Las Positas Road and the freeway, Gross Brothers was going to build their um, auto sales um, business. But um, unfortunately, that didn't work out too well. So. Yeah, so who owns the houses there? I, I, I'm afraid I don't know at this point. Okay. Um, another question we have is where was Michael Livermore Senior House located? And I wonder if it was by Walmart. Okay, the best I can find out, uh, talking to different people, looking at different maps, the best I can tell is, um, well, we showed where that gas station is that's been restored. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you go to that gas station and then go immediately uh, east from there, there's a, uh, um, a big apartment complex and you can come in. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. There's a road that goes into that big apartment complex. Anyway, uh, along the Arroyo, there's an old oak tree that um, looks very much like one we saw in a painting that was done of the Robert Livermore house. And so we're thinking it must have been right in that general area. I can't prove it, but uh, that, that seems to be um, a, a good guess where it was. Okay, yeah, and, and Carol asked about the, Go the Gokin Ranch, and I know I just totally mass massacred that name, so I'm very sorry. Where was that at? Then Sarah actually responded and said, it's her neighbor, and they were told it was originally built as a small cowboy cabin. When it was a ranch, it's been added to on since. Do you have any background on that, Richard? Uh, is that the, the Gokin place you're saying? Yes. Um, yeah, there's a house there now. I don't know how old it is, but as, as I remember it, and I've been trying to get a hold of Ann, and I uh, haven't had good luck. As I remember it, there was an older house very near the road, um, and it's gone now. Um, now maybe that was just my imagination. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what's going. Oh, and, and I, I might add something about the Livermore house. You know, as you um, let's see, I forget the name of the road. Right when you uh, about halfway between uh, Target and where all the auto dealers are. 
there's a uh, an overpass that goes um, uh, to the north side of the freeway. And I can't remember the name of the road. I think it starts with a C, but whatever. Anyway, as you cross that, um, it turns to the right. And I understand the FFA um, high school kids kept animals there for a long time. I don't know if they still do or not. But anyway, there's a wet area there. And I've been told, and, and I'd be real interested to see what other folks say. I've been told that that was the, um, the Los Positos. That's where the, the spring was that um, the, the, the whole area was named after. And it's where Robert Livermore Jr., his house was right in that area, I understand. Okay. And I have another question for you. Someone was interested in the house next to Bachman's and on 2nd Street and 2046 2 2nd Street and to the house of the right of it. I think I even know the answer to this one, but I'll let you do it, Richard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I think they're talking about the Raboli Mansion. <laughs> I think that's it. The big yellow brick house. Yeah, that uh, that was the, uh, if that's the one, I, I think that's who they're talking about. That was the Raboli house. Uh, Raboli um, was, uh, they own the winery that was at the other end of that block, which is now Monica's Restaurant. And before that was Knox Flowers for many, many years. And um, so that's where they started their wine business. They also own the Indian in the basement. They started out with a saloon and then uh, finally did well and then got up on the first floor where the Indian is now. Uh, the small house, uh, the, which a lot of people call the Raboli Cottage, but actually it was built uh, for a Harland. And we're uh, pretty sure, uh, let's see, which one? Ah, I can't remember which one offhand. Uh, anyway, a Harlan who came um, with his uncle, George Harlan, in the last wagon train that came over the Sierras in 1846. And they had gone across the country, sometimes with the Donners, sometimes not. Uh, but it, they had an argument with the Donners. And the Donners um, said, hey, it never snows in October. And the horses are sick. The oxen are sick. We've got to uh, uh, settle down a little bit here because to they have to take all the wagons apart to get them up over the Sierras. And uh, and Harlan said no, that he just had a feeling it was going to snow, and so he moved his people ahead. And of course they made it, and a, a good number of the people in the Donner Party did not make it. And I have a I think um, Craig's asking a question about. How did they move houses in the 19th and early 20th century? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, one of the things I've been asked to talk about, and, and I don't have enough inf information yet, uh, but there were a lot of houses that were moved. I mean, lots and lots of houses were moved. And I remember when I came to, uh, to Livermore in, in the early uh, 1960s, uh, they were still moving houses. And some of you know the um, um, the Brown uh, Sig House, that was where um, the uh, Mexican restaurant is at, at Third and uh, L Street. That was moved all the way out to Tesla, up on a hill. And then let's see, oh, the Reinstein House was um, I think where Wells Fargo is now, and that was moved way way out uh, north of uh, Livermore. And so uh, in modern, and oh, the biggest one we all know about was at the corner of K and the 4th Street, uh, Dr. Gordon's house that was moved out to the intersection of um, Tesla and uh, Livermore Avenue. And then later it was moved into the middle of uh, Ken Canyon's uh, vineyards uh, where it is now and has been really nicely uh, restored, at least on the outside. And I have one more question. Actually, I'd like to know the answer to this one too. Nancy wants to know, has Richard written any historical books about Livermore and where can we get them? That was my, I added that, I'd love to. Well, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, but we're right in the process right now. And, and hopefully in the next uh, month or two, it'll be in print. 
what what uh, some of us have been working on for what's it been three four years now is um, we're trying to to uh, uh, look at all the plaques in Livermore and find out why they were given and and uh, uh, something about the people they were given or the house they were given to or whatever. And so I think a lot of people will find that interesting. And um, so that's, um, again, that's going to happen. It's uh, not too far down the road. There's two other books we've been working on, and I don't know when we'll ever get them done. One is uh, the Civil War veterans. I don't know how many people know, but there's well over 100 Civil War veterans lived in the Livermore Valley. I mean, how many people would have ever guessed? Most of them lived up in the hills. They got um, uh, um, property rights. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, bounty rights from uh, the federal government for their service during the Civil War. And so a lot of the property way up in the hills behind Del Val was owned by Civil War veterans. The other thing we're working on uh, that I think a lot of people would find interesting, and that is all the people that were buried at uh, the old Oak Knoll Cemetery, again, at the corner of Wall and uh, Stanley. Uh, lots and lots of, uh, including the Harlands um, who came over in that uh, 1846 um, uh, last wagon train. But lots and lots of um, people that were tremendously uh, influential in, in settling our town. So that those are two books that are down the road. And again, the plaque book, um, hopefully in the next month or two. Great. That's that. I, I'm looking forward to that, I can tell you. I think that's all the questions that we have, Richard. There's someone, Dave did mention that his brother met metal detected on the Robert Livermore Jr. house and, and found a 1848 and dying. And he said, Mike Livermore lives there and the house there was rebuilt on the old Robert Livermore Jr. Foundation. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. And uh, yeah, that's on my list of things to check out. I've got a long list and I can't keep up with it. <laughs> well, I'm excited to wait for the, I'm excited for the book, so. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I think that's all the questions I have. Um, Blanche, did you see any more or did I get them all covered? Those are all the ones, um, somebody had their hand up. One of the oh. participants, it was um, Wendy Ellison. Let me see. I don't know if she has a question for that she can put into the Q&A. Let me ask. Hi, Wendy. Are you able to talk? Yes, I just wanted to praise the writing of books by Rich Fan. Uh, so I put my hand up. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. I had another comment. I'm always interested in um, how the Redwood got down to the Bay Area to build all these houses. And when I'm driving around town, I look at the plumbing pipes on the outsides of these houses. They didn't have indoor plumbing, so you can tell old houses, right? Yeah, no, that's that's true. I don't know when, uh, let's see, one of the doctor's houses, and I can't remember which one, was the first house that's reported to have indoor plumbing. It, it might be Dr. Gordon's house out at uh, Kincannon's. I'm not sure. As far as the Redwoods go, it turns out the Oakland Hills, uh, Berkeley Hills were full of Redwoods. And uh, in the Moraga area, tremendous number of redwoods and uh, so they would haul the the logs in um, either to mills in that area or sometimes i understand they, they'd bring the whole logs over to uh, the valley and then um, they'd have sawmills here that would cut them up but anyway the hills were just full of uh, redwoods in fact in the oakland hills there's still a, a very very large grove of uh, uh what's the name of that i think the settlement's called canyon if i remember right Hmm. And we have, we do have one um, last question that I, I even know the answer to this, but I'll leave that to you, Richard. And um, do you ever do historic home tours? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we have. Um, 
we, we've done them uh, for the uh, Heritage Hill and we've done them for uh, LARPD. And uh, when that's going to happen again, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, like, hopefully soon. <laughs> hopefully soon. Okay. You never know. Yeah. We'll have to see. And again, uh, the plan right now is Susan Canfield will do one. Uh, when I talked to her a week or so ago, um, yeah. she's planning on doing one, uh, depending upon several things. But right now, the plan is to uh, to do one sometime this fall of the uh, Turbano area. But I know people have also asked about uh, doing more tours downtown in the, in the south side. So we've got to talk about that when, when this COVID business settles down a, a bit more. Yeah, we're slowly getting back to normal, hopefully. Yes, thank goodness. Richard, what's the, what's the best um, way for a person to go about finding out about a house that they're curious about? If they're just kind of see, see a building that's interesting to them, how do you recommend starting that kind of research? Well, there's a, a couple of ways. Um, one is some of us have a, um, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is. It's not really a book, but uh, well, maybe you could call it a book anyway. <laughs> A big thick thing. That's uh, the uh, nineteen. What was it? Nineteen eighty-eight uh, survey uh, done of historic uh, buildings in Livermore, and uh, some of that is apparently not one hundred percent right. But it's a very very good place to start. So I'd start there. If it's not in there, the next best thing is if the Heritage uh, Building was open, the the Carnegie uh, Building was open. Um, you could put a request in and um, people um, can check them out. Loretta Kasky, who's super, super busy, but she is really a whiz. If you can tell her about where um, the property is, um, she can look it up and, and we can go through the old tax records then. And it's kind of interesting. You look at the old tax records for the property and all of a sudden, if there's a jump in the tax rate, you can pretty well figure that must be the year the house was built. But again, we it's uh, very difficult to do that right now. But when we open up, and hopefully that won't be too far down the road, that uh, we can start doing that for the public again. Good. Thanks for explaining that. Thank you, Richard. It looks like Loretta's writing in they, the city. The city. I know they were working on that. Yeah, they. They just updated that historic resource. In the yeah, that's being worked on right now. So I'm waiting for my final copy. <laughs> yeah, some of us uh, have volunteered to do that. And uh, um, in fact, they just put out a call. Uh, they want people to take uh, photographs of some of the houses they don't have uh, photographs of. And so some of us are volunteering to do that. So hopefully in the next few months, uh, the, the newest one will be uh, uh, done. And that that's a pretty good survey, I think, from what I've seen, um, because it'll be the whole town then. Not not just, uh, there was another one done, when was it, in the early 2000s, 2006, I think, something like that. But it was just around 1st and 2nd, 3rd Street. And, um, and so it missed lots of the, to me, the really neat old houses. Uh, that are in town, mainly on the south side. But as we saw tonight, there's there's some pretty neat houses on the north side too. There are. I, was, I thought that was great. I'm sure, I'm sure you've inspired many of us to go take a walk around the north side or a drive around the north side. I didn't recognize some of those houses, so yeah. I'll have to check out the neighborhood more carefully. Okay, super. <laughs> Well, thank you, Richard. We really appreciate it. And again, another one of your, we like to call them blockbuster talks now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. You did a fantastic job, as well, always. We appreciate well, thank it. everybody for joining us. And if yes. they can uh, help us with some of our, uh, our quests, I sure appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And good thank night. Everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night.